So in the previous video, we talked about the load and store architecture. Uh, I should just mention this very specifically that the uh, ARM CPUs are based on the load store architecture, which is uh, also called the RISC architecture, reduced instruction set, uh, you know, computer architecture, something like that. Uh, so now as part of this, what we are going to do is, as part of this video, what we are going to do uh, is we are going to look at how can one go about, um, you know, how can uh, one learn uh, everything about the CPU, you know, and as an embedded, uh, you know, embedded software engineer, like as an embedded software engineer, what all do you need to know about a CPU to master it? That's what we are going to look at now. And later, with that perspective, we'll dive into the M class CPUs, right? So, first off, a software engineer need not know how the underlying circuitry of a CPU is, right? That's not required. And that's a kind of a glimpse of that we saw uh, in the mental model that we cooked up, um, you know, in the previous video. We said that there was, you know, memory, there was CPU, and CPU was a bunch of registers. Uh, you know, some status, some config, and then there was some circuitry here to do actual computation, right? And what was this circuitry? It was, uh, you know, ALU. And uh, we need not know how the ALU is constructed, how the registers are constructed, uh, you know, and just FYI, uh, a register is nothing but a memory, uh, you know, storage unit, right? They are made of D flip-flops. So you can have like the flip flop can say one bit uh, if you combine them together uh, like into let's say 32 bits then that's a register of 32 bits and then you can imagine there are you know many of those to store intermittent like uh, intermediate data and to process um, uh, you know that data all right so this is the model we saw in the previous video the question then we are answering is how can one learn CPU, like everything about it. So much like this mental model, the CPU memory interaction, um, we need to to learn a CPU. We need to master something called the programmer's model, right? Programmer's uh, model, the exception model, the memory model. And in some cases, there is also like the debug model, right? So if we master these models, the way of thinking, so to speak, uh, you pretty much can reason about the CPU in its entirety, right? You can argue with hardware engineers, you can ask them, uh, you know, proper questions to learn more about how the underlying CPU works. So uh, let's revisit the idea of CPU. A CPU, as you know some buses it can have one bus or more buses or like one pair of bus or more pairs of bus in our case we'll assume that there is a pair two pair of buses one for the instruction uh, to fetch the instruction from the memory so it will be you know unidirectional so here what we are doing is we'll float the address of the location from where the instruction should be fetched and the instruction will come on this bus right and this crawl, like slash here means uh, the bus is multi-bit it's not a single wire it's many wires right uh, similarly we'll have yet another you know pair of bus which we'll call the data bus right and on the data bus we have again the address of the region from where the data should be fetched and that data will be fetched on the data bus right this is the actual bus where we'll get the bits now this is bi-directional because we can perform a read which is bring into the cpu and we can perform the write which is sent back to the memory nice so this is what a cpu in general has the other thing that the cpu has are interrupts uh, interrupts right so the idea of interrupt is that it's an ex external hardware signal and once that arrives uh, the CPU, uh, while it's executing its linear flow, now needs to take a decision to go do something else. Um, this is much like, you know, you're reading a book, 
someone knocks at the door, you put a bookmark, go attend to the door, you know, come back and continue reading your book. So con the, reading the book was the CPU executing some task and answering the door well, was like an interrupt, something that, you know, it had to change, uh, park its current operations, go do something else for a while and then come back and continue. So there's a provision for that that the CPU needs to, you know, account and that's called interrupts. And then there is another thing, which is, let's say, if the CPU is trying to, uh, you know, fetch some memory address, but that memory address does not exist. Uh, in that case, uh, we call that an exception. The CPU will kind of, you know, internal circuitry uh, will kind of again tell the CPU, hey, you know, you wanted this address, it's not available. Uh, then much like an interrupt, it needs to account for that exception, right? Exception and interrupts are pretty much the same thing with one, you know, uh, difference, which is exception happens internal to the CPU, it can be handled, and an inter interrupt is something external to the CPU. That's the uh, only difference. And then the exception related things are covered as part of the exception model. Right? That's the link between exception model um, and, you know, the part of the CPU uh, that, that kind of is involved in handling those. Okay, so this is the CPU with buses, interrupts, exceptions. So the exception model kind of talks about how the CPU can handle interrupts. The programmer's model details out you know, the mode of operation of the CPU and the internal registers that the CPU has. You know, how can a programmer imagine the CPU to do the computation? That's part of the programmer's model. And then when we talk about the memory model, uh, it specifies as to how the CPU interacts with the memory. You know, uh, so how does it interact with the memory? So people have implemented a lot of tricks in terms of speeding up the computation. So sometimes what happens is, uh, the CPU, let's say it has performed certain calculations. So what it can do is it can internally, you know, store those results and then send it out to the memory as a burst, right? Four or five operations, right? Operations together. So the memory model then talks about features of, the, of those nature. It's like, does the CPU keep the answers with itself until, you know, certain set is complete and then send it out? Or does it send out one answer at a time? So that is part of the mental model. And then beyond all of this, there is usually a debug model uh, that talks about that, you know, there is an external circuitry here that you can, you know, connect some external hardware to, which can control your CPU or let you, you know, read the internal registers and so on and so forth. So this, by the way, is called hardware debugger. Right. And you can imagine GDB, uh, but connected to a hardware and that hardware actually controls the CPU. It can execute one instruction at a time, you know, give you internal view of what the CPU is doing. So that, how that is done, uh, what features are available as part of the debug, that's part of the debug model. And so for the rest of our series now, what we are going to do is only focus on the programmer's model and talk about the absolute essential that you must know to be able to be productive and contribute to a team that's working on an M-class CPU.